Awesome. Folks, we're going to get going today. Welcome to this ProCEP webinar. I'm Janice Petley, and I will be your presenter today. And the topic is Back to the Basics, Project Management and Business Analysis. And it's uh, great to have uh, so many people joining us. And we have several cities represented, represented today, and that's great to have that. So just a little housekeeping note to start. There is a questions feature on your screen, and you can ask questions at any time. And I just want to manage expectations because I might not be able to answer all your questions, but uh, if I can, I will answer some questions during the presentation, and then I'll address as many questions as I can at the end of the session. Okay, here we go. So just our learning objectives for today. We're gonna to get a very basic understanding of, of project management and business analysis. We don't have uh, the time to go into these topics at great depth. And uh, my, my goal is that at the end of this session that uh, you're gonna be able to uh, determine if project management and business analysis tools would help you at work. Would, it, would they improve your, your work environment? And hopefully, too, you'll be sort of motivated to go back to work and try to improve your project management and business analysis processes. So just a little bit about who we are. We are a uh, project management consulting and training company. And um, we have put a large number of people uh, through um, preparation for the PMP exam. At this point, we're working with uh, five universities. And we expect to make another announcement uh, very soon about a new university partner. We're what is called a registered education provider with the Project Management Institute and an, and an endorsed education provider with the International Institute of Business Analysis and an accredited training provider with the Information Systems Examination Board. So enough of all that stuff. Now let, let's dive in. I want you to think about some of your projects. And my question to you has is, has this ever happened to you? Now, please feel free to use the questions feature to weigh in and make any comments you may uh, like to make as we go. Now, I should say that these, uh, these points might be more relevant to internal projects as opposed to companies who work for external customers and project-driven companies. And I see some comments are coming in already. So some of these points are actually striking a chord. Okay, let me see if I can capture a few of these comments that are coming in. Uh, Derek says that uh, resources are a constant problem because we never know what we need. It's always a scramble at the last minute. Another comment here is, um, is we don't have PMs and our technical people end up being the project managers too. And that would be me and I'm frustrated. Okay, well that's a good one. And let me just see if I can capture one more comment. Oh, I like this one here. This kind of wraps it up rather nicely. Uh, the comment is, no one really understands why we're doing most of these projects. So, folks, I, I, based on the feedback there, I can see that I won't be wasting your time, and hopefully there'll be something that you'll be able to take away from this presentation. I'd like to provide people with factual information whenever I can, and when looking for the results of research, it's, it's often easier to find information about IT projects because there's been a lot more studies done on IT projects and other projects, but IT projects are very much like just about any other project. And here's a study here from Forrester Research, and uh, they found that um, project management remains the biggest skill gap for 2007, and I'm sure nothing much has changed in the first few months of 2008. And that CIOs complain that educational institutions just aren't putting enough people through. Often what educational uh, organizations do, uh, I'm talking about universities and colleges, is they 
not so much colleges, but certainly universities, is we train people along functional lines. So finance people learn about finance and marketing people learn about marketing. But they don't study something like pro project management that tends to span functional departments. And I've even had MBAs in programs, then they have spent a single day studying project management. Now here's an interesting study here at the uh, Standish Group's Chaos Report. And a group of executives were surveyed to weigh the importance of different items as they relate to projects. And user involvement was a, a very important factor of whether or not a project was successful. Executive management support, also key. If you don't have executive management on, on side, then you're, then you're in trouble. Clear statement of requirements. That is very much a business analysis function, proper planning, next on the list, a project management role, realistic expectations, now we're back to the BA role, the business analysis role, smaller project milestones, that's a project management function, and so on down the list. Now here's the kicker. Look right to the bottom of the list, right there, hardworking, focused staff at the very bottom. So our projects aren't failing because of lazy staff that don't care. And that's kind of discouraging, you know, because sometimes people think it's the fault of the staff and it's not. You know, we really have a whole combination of project management and business analysis issues that we have to deal with. So what is business analysis? Well, the first point uh, is the definition of business analysis according to the International Institute of Business Analysis. Projects fail because requirements of the, or the business problem are not fully understood. And um, often people come to the project manager with what they think is the solution, but the so-called solution doesn't really solve the problem, and those projects usually fail. The business analyst defines what needs to be done, but not how. That is up to the PM and the project management team. You know, an investigation of an issue or business problem, identifying strengths and weaknesses, and then using analysis and documentation to, produ to uh, produce the future state, that's all part of the BA function. So they're defining what needs to be done, but not how. So here's another little graphic that can maybe help you uh, by, by giving you this visual. So what a business analyst does can, can be different from one organization to the other, but essentially what they are is they're the link. They're the link between the client and the solution team. And the client in this graphic can either be internal to your organization or it can be an external customer. We say that the business analyst elicits, analyzes, validates, and documents. And they try to find the problem, not the solution. They can work on projects, and that is the role we're talking about today, but business analysts also work on process improvement uh, situations in, in operational environments. So there are some uh, key skills for business analysts. They need good verbal skills. Communication skills are extremely important. They must be able to work well with people, especially if they are to get good information from people. It's important that they can ramp up to new environments and adapt quickly, and that analytical mindset, that diagnostic toolkit is very important. And finally, uh, business analysts must be very organized because you get a lot of information, so it's important that they can organize it in a fashion that uh, they can understand that others can as well. There are some good habits for business analysts. Now, these are a little different than, than, than skills, because we talked about skills. Business analysts should use the iterative techniques that allow them to collect misinformation and clarify misunderstandings, et cetera. They shouldn't be a short order cook, but just serves up what people ask for, because that can be quite a mess. Because people don't often see the whole picture, so the business analyst must see the big picture. The methodology, that's the approach to take. And there always must be a defined approach, a well-defined approach. And some flexibility, though, may be necessary because the same approach might not work for all projects. So select an approach, but once you have an approach and a methodology, you know, work with that process. Business analysts have to listen well. Very important to be a good listener and also to ask the appropriate questions at the appropriate time and always document.
all this important to document. A variety of techniques can help business analysts in their role. And here's a few of them right here. Flowcharts can help um, organize uh, a process in a graphical manner and make it clear uh, who is impacted at every stage. Affinity charts can organize facts and opinions, ideas, those sorts of things, and issues into sort of natural groupings. And this grouping is in turn used as an aid in diagnosing complex problems. So let, let's just look at a few of these uh, different tools. Now this one here is a fishbone diagram. And with this fishbone di diagram, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out why we have poor gas mileage. So you can see over on the right side of your screen, it says poor gas mileage. And we have four categories here, methods, machinery, people, and materials. So let's look under machinery, for example. And under machinery, we have um, under deflated tires. It's one possible reason. We could have a tire pressure. Yes, we got that tire pressure, worn out air systems, carburetor adjustments, etc. So this helps us uh, think of all the possible causes as to why we are having this problem. We can use flow charts. And this one here is a why Mary's Kitchen caught fire. So this sort of charts that process. And you've probably seen some of these before, but this is very much a, a, a BA tool, a business analyst tool. This one here that is building on your screen now is a Pareto diagram. And Pareto was an Italian uh, sociologist and economist around the turn of the century. Now, not the century that just turned, but uh, the one before that. And his uh, rule was that 20% of the population had 80% of the wealth. So therefore, the only way to improve the lot of the poor was to raise the overall income levels in society. Now, when we talk about the Pareto uh, principle and the Pareto 80-20 rule, we're not talking about money. We're not talking about people in Italy. What we're actually talking about is that uh, we need to pay attention to the vital 20% of the things that cause our problems. And often people get focused on the wrong things. So with this, with this uh, particular uh, screen you have right now, we might be particularly fascinated with case squabble and axle cocking, for example. But that's no, not where we should be focusing our energies. We need to focus on our energies where we're going to get the greatest return. So that's what the 80-20 rule is when we're talking about quality management and business analysis, project management in those fields. Now we're just going to move on to another role that uh, is very important for the BAs, and that is the whole development of the business case. Now the business case, um, you know, sometimes called an assessment or a feasibility study, and there are many definitions of the business case. And and uh, if we ask different different people and different subject matter experts, they may tell us something different. But this is our definition from a business analyst perspective. And the business case includes an analysis of the business uh, business process performance and associated needs and problems, that sort of thing, proposed solutions, assumptions, constraints, and also a risk-adjusted uh, risk cost-benefit analysis. So just to sort of turn that back into English, what we're doing with the business case, especially if it's to be effective, we're saying, why are we doing this? Why should we spend this money? And why should we spend the money on this initiative as opposed to on something else? Business analysis is distinct from financial analysis, system analysis, project management, uh, quality assurance, all these sorts of things. Now, depending on an organization, an individual business analyst may perform some or all of these related functions. And they bring with them you know, knowledge and experience to the subject, but they don't have to be subject matter experts before completing the analysis. So at this stage, we've now set the uh, stage with what a business analyst does. Let's switch gears and we'll talk about project management. So a few definitions just to get us going here. A project. A project is a temporary an endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. Or result. Pro uh, projects are unique in their entirety, and that means that um, 
they haven't been done before. The entire thing hasn't been done before. Parts of it may have been, but not the entire thing. And projects can actually be uh, be uh, put in place to create a product or a service, and those are the ones we're often very familiar with. But they can also create a result. So, for example, if a company wants their employees to think differently about something, then in fact you'd be putting a project in place and implementing a project to create a result. Now let's look at the definition of project management. Application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities in order to meet project requirements. Knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques, all these things can be learned and uh, to meet project requirements. Because uh, this is what we're trying to do, is we're trying to meet project requirements. We're not trying to exceed them, we want to meet them. And it is up to the BA to determine what the requirements are. If there's no BA, then in fact, the PM must actually do, do that job. Project management can help us focus on our objectives and also on our customer requirements. If we need to make a change or coordinate across disciplines, then project management can be very helpful for that. And it can also help us respond quickly to change it more rapidly than we could if we're just using our other day-to-day -day business skills. There is the Project Management Institute, which some of you may be familiar with. In fact, some of you may even be members. And uh, you can find more information out about that at www.pmi.org. The Project Management Institute is a nonprofit organization. They have uh, a couple of different designations for project managers. And the first one here is the PMP, the Project Management Professional Designation. And there's also the CAPM, the Certified Associate in Project Management, which is more of a, a junior version of the uh, PMP. And the Project Management Institute puts, has a publication they put up every four years. And it's called the Project Management Body of Knowledge, or the PMBOK. So if you hear people talking about the PMBOK, that is uh, what they are referring to. Now, actually, I'm going to go to a question now because there was a question that came in earlier. And I think I'll address that now because this is sort of a good time to, to, bring, it, to bring, the, bring it up. Um, the question is, and it's from Elizabeth. And the question is, is the CAPM recognized or should a person just wait to get their hours of experience and then go for the PMP? Well, first of all, I want to say that the, the CAPM, you can either do study for that, you can take this a course, or you can use uh, your, your, uh, your experience. And you don't need a tremendous number of hours of experience. The PMP, on the other hand, you need 4,500 hours leading and directing project tasks or 7,500 hours if you don't have an undergraduate degree. So my, my answer would be, well, it really depends. If you are going to have your hours within a matter of a few months, six months, well, then I would say wait and get the PMP. If you feel that it's going to be a year or two that before you get the hours for the PMP, then I would definitely encourage people to go for the CAPM. I, I encourage people to do that because if they find that it sort of shakes some training dollars loose in their organization and they can then they're basically stating this is the route I'm going, and so they're able to often get funding for more courses. And for organizations, I think it's good for your people to have a direction, to have a focus. And if you can give them some milestones and some intermediate steps towards the PMP, I think that that can be very helpful. So it really does depend on the situation, but uh, certainly the CAPM, we are now seeing more people going that direction, especially if they will never actually be a project manager, they're probably more going to be on a team or it's going to be a while before they get their hours in. The International Institute of Business Analysis, that's the equivalent to the Project Management Institute, and they also have a body of knowledge and they have the CBAC designation, and that is the Certified Business Analyst Professional. Project manager, we liken sometimes to an orchestra conductor. So let's take a look at the skills required for project managers. Orchestra conductors don't know how to play all the instruments in the orchestra, but they certainly know which passages of music are going to be the most difficult for the musicians. And then they can focus their energies on helping those musicians through those difficult through those difficult sections. 
And something I've noticed about orchestras, because I've worked with a number of them, is they don't tend to play without a conductor. And when the assistant conductor is waving the baton, yeah. they don't sound quite as good as they do when the real conductor is actually in charge. So, there, so let's draw the analogy back to project management. So PMs aren't the subject matter experts, so they're not the individual musicians. But um, the orchestra, the PM, just like the orchestra conductor, that's the person who is the leader, who keeps everyone together, who keeps everyone moving in the same direction and focused on the important things. When we talk about developing project managers, you know, we need to develop obviously skills, ability, knowledge, those sorts of things. And it's certainly possible to do that. There are ways we can do that. So we say that, you know, we train for those skills. But when it comes to things like willingness and motivation and traits, they're much harder to develop. So we try to select the people that have those skills and abilities. We need to talk a little bit about distinguishing between the business analyst and the project manager because they are complementary roles. They work in partnership, but sometimes the lines can get a little blurred, especially in organizations where people are actually doing both jobs. And I was just doing some training last week on the East Coast, and the organization had people, in fact, doing both a VA and a PM role at the same time, but they tended to to put those people on the smaller projects. Once the project became a certain size, then they divided the role, and there were very distinct positions. There were business analyst positions and project manager positions. A sponsor, a very important uh, person to keep in mind on projects, and we've got to have a sponsor. The sponsor is the person who has the money. They are the ones who say, here's the money, you can go ahead and do this project. And they have a number of roles. It's not, it's not just about money. It is a bit more than money because they are the friend in high places. You know, if the project manager is having problems or maybe they don't have the authority to solve a certain issue, maybe they're having trouble with resources, they've got an external customer that's, you know, a little bit difficult, then that's when the sponsor needs to step in and, and, uh, and help out. And I once had a fellow in a class, and he said um, he was having some problems, and he was describing his problems. And I said, well, it sounds like you have a sponsorship issue. You don't have a good sponsorship. And he said, oh, no, I have the best sponsor in the company. I said, oh, really? Well, who, who's your sponsor? Well, the owner of the company is a sponsor, he said. I said, oh, wow. And he said, yeah, this, this project is so important that the owner is the sponsor. I said, oh, well, that sounds great. But... Why don't you go talk to him about these problems? Oh, I can't talk to him about these problems because he's so important. He's the owner. He doesn't have time for it. I said, well, then you don't have a sponsor. Then we kind of went around in circles. But the bottom line is you need a sponsor who's present. A sponsor needs to be present and accessible to the project manager. If you don't have a sponsor that's accessible, you're on your own. And that's not a very good situation. Uh, there's a uh, project management guru named Harold Kersner. And Kersner says that Priority projects should have a sponsor from senior management, whereas sort of lower priority projects could have a sponsor from, you know, middle management. With the project team, there's a lot of different people involved. We can have um, we can have uh, the client or customer be both internal or external. We can have multiple levels of customers. For example, um, a pharmaceutical company may have customers that would include the doctors who prescribe the drug, the patients who take it, the insurance, who, the uh, insurers who pay for it, etc. On this team, you'd also have your subject matter experts, your, your BA, sponsor, various technical resources, etc. The stakeholder has uh, this definition here that I'm going to show you, and this is uh, a definition from the PEMBOK. But essentially, a stakeholder is anyone who's impacted by the project. That can be positively or negatively. I'm on a board of directors, and we recently went through a strategic process to put together a, a strategic plan for the next three years. And one of the things we had to do was identify our stakeholders. And people were arguing, saying, oh, no, that person's not a stakeholder. Whereas I was saying, they are a stakeholder. They are impacted by our organization. It's just that we're not going to deal with them right now or we can't meet their needs in this fiscal year. 
But if someone is impacted, then they are a stakeholder. And, we, and, and at, at some point, you should be considering these people. Here's a drawing here just to sort of show you all the variety of stakeholders that you may have on a project. And inside the circle, we have the internal stakeholders, which are your functional managers, such as your department managers, uh, sponsors, team members, customers. Maybe you have a PMO, a project management office. And then you have external customers. And on the, the left-hand side of the screen, you know, we have the unions or the government, financial institutions, those sorts of things. And you'll notice a dotted line down the screen. And on one side of the dotted line, you have the negative stakeholders. Those are people who either are impacted negatively by your project or people who simply wish you weren't doing this project. And in project management, those are the ones we really have to be careful about because we must identify them and we must try to understand their needs and expectations. Because if we don't, they will do us the I guess you really can't call it a favor, but they will identify themselves to us, but it will be at the least opportune time. And at that point then, we may have a major problem. And when I was working on the SARS concert in Toronto, I had to talk with stakeholders who were over on that negative side. And they didn't want the rock concert in their backyard. So I had to then talk to them and talk to them about the benefits of having this in their city. Uh, because, you know, they too would benefit if we could put Toronto back on the map in a, in a positive light. Here's the uh, project life cycle here. And um, we can't talk about business analysis or project management without, without taking a look at this. Projects are divided into generic phases. And these phases are collectively known as a project as a project life cycle. And we have initial phases, we have intermediate phases, and we also have uh, final phases. So in the initial phases, uh, we may be doing things like a charter statement, might be a statement of work, and then we continue to move on to a scope statement and so on. And the number of phases and the length of the phases are determined by the needs of the project. Now here's another way of looking at it. The BA, the business analyst, is active through the justify and define, just, sorry, conceive, justify, plan through to design. That's where they are most active. And during the planning phase, this is where they're using various tools such as gap analysis, stakeholder analysis, and, and they're determining the requirements. And throughout the other phases, then, the, the business analyst will consult to make sure that uh, or that changes aren't being implemented into the project or that people aren't recommending changes and trying to get them through. If it's just change for the sake of change, we need to make sure that there's actually you know, real requirements that are being met by implementing these changes. But projects fail at the beginning. You know, whether we're back here, and I'm just gonna go back to the previous screen, whether we're back here in the initial phases, if you want to look at it that way, or if you want to look at this version in the conceive and justify plan design, that's when projects fail at the beginning. The uh, project manager has uh, a role throughout the project life cycle, and it may vary. They might not be as involved early on, but ideally we want to get them involved as soon as we can, even if they're not involved in the requirements definition phase. But then they will remain involved once they start throughout the whole project life cycle. But the type of leadership that they provide might vary from one phase to the next. The PM's job is not complete until we get these lessons learned and documented. That's an extremely important job of the project manager. Fixing a problem only gets more expensive. If we can determine our requirements early on, like in the concept and planning phase, we can get those requirements uh, um, incorporated into the project. But if we don't discover those requirements until later on, until late in the execution phase, or maybe at that point we determine, we, we find out there's a stakeholder we forgot to identify, then it gets very, very expensive to fix those problems. Just a couple words about scope management. Now, scope management is, is uh, I think, something that on many projects can take people um, 
can take people over budget, can, can force, the, force delays in a project. And I just want to just mention a few things about it. Now, even though there's a lot of things to, that will be part of the scope management plan, the most important thing is how are we going to handle changes to scope? And we actually have to plan ahead of time for that. We can't wait till the first scope change comes along and then decide, gee, now what do we do? Who should we talk to? We have to have a process in place. And this process will be um, you know, a, a, very, a very detailed process in terms of who do we consult uh, about it. And um, we need to assess the impact on, on cost, on time, on quality, on, on, uh, on all the aspects of the project. Now, on simpler projects, it can be sort of uh, light and informal, but uh, you know, on larger projects, you probably need to have something called a change control board. And that change control board then would be the, would be the, uh, the group that are, are determining whether or not certain changes should be implemented. The work breakdown structure defines the total scope of the project. And originally, this was uh, developed to assist in unmanageable, complex projects with diverse participants and long time spans. But now it's seen as uh, applicable to virtually any, any size of project. So here's one here. And the important thing to remember about the, uh, about the WBS is that sequence is not implied. There is no sequence here. And people are always trying to get the WBS in sequence, and that's not a very good habit. So for example, if I'm going to town and I'm going to do some errands, I have to figure out what I need to pick up and what I need to drop off before I can put the errands in an appropriate sequence. So what we're doing here is we're figuring out all the things we need to do and we're going to get them in this WBS and then we can figure out what the sequence should be. Now here's another format here. This is an outline WBS and right there you can see that uh, that lowest element on on any branch is the work is the work package. That's where the actual work takes place. Now, what I'd like to ask you too is, have you ever been working on a project and you're ready to spend the money on something that's like a very important element, and someone tells you that you can't spend the money because it's, and I quote, not in the budget? Somewhere, someone has a budget, maybe in accounting, and it has nothing to do with the work that actually has to be done. Before a detailed budget can be created, you need to do a work breakdown structure. And then what you can do is you can attach the dollar value to the various elements in the work breakdown structure. And this makes it much easier to have a budget and a plan that actually work. It also makes life much easier if someone comes along, perhaps a senior manager or your boss or the sponsor, the customer, and says, I need you to cut $25,000. And you can say, sure, um, I can cut um, item 1.2.1, uh, the $25,000 there for catering. I can cut that. Oh, no, you don't want me to cut that? Okay, then I can cut, um, how about if I cut item 1.3, the $17,000 of the workstations? I can cut that. And of course, that's not going to go over very well either. So if you actually have your WBS and your budget linked in this way, you can easily show people what functionality they're going to lose if they cut something out of the budget. Also, the WBS can help us with the uh, responsibilities in terms of who's doing what. You know, this way people can't say, oh, I thought so-and-so was doing it. Well, here we go. We can put the names right on the tasks. It's very clear who's doing what. And uh, it also helps us with the problem that, that someone mentioned earlier, and that was that uh, we don't know what resources we required. So if we can actually break it down, break down the tasks, assign people, then we can maybe do a much better job of figuring out how many hours are required on any, on, on any given project. Now remember I said the work breakdown structure is not in sequence. So we have to now put all these things in sequence. And you might be wondering what this is. It might be looking like a very unusual thing to be showing you. But what this is, is an actual um, uh, planning session that we had for one of our clients. And they, we had their work breakdown structure and then we were getting it put in sequence. So we were facilitating this session in terms of what we needed to do first and when we did a certain task, what task could then follow and so on. 
And of course, during this process, you may see that you've forgotten something. And so in this case, there were some things that were forgotten and you can see the, the bright pink post-it notes. So we had to add some things in. And this process uh, would help us determine our critical path, which is our longest path, the longest sequence of activities through our logic diagram or the longest sequence of activities on the project. So that would help us determine when this project could actually end. Now this is a, a critical path here, and now I'm, I'm not going to go into how you do all the calculations, but uh, it's a very useful tool, and it can tell us a lot of different things, like for example, if you were assigned two different tasks that, that were to take place at the same time, it would help you decide which one you should do first and which one you should do second. It will also tell you what the earliest possible time is you could finish this project. A lot of good information that, that we can uh, derive from our logic diagram. And often people throw around the word critical path, you know, your critical path schedule, and all they mean, all they talk about is, is dates on a calendar, and that's really not what it is. Uh, critical path, it's, it's a whole different process uh, than a lot of people go through to actually figure out their schedule. So critical path is something that is a very important tool. Now here we have here, this is a Microsoft project. So we have a schedule here. And if you look up at the top on the left-hand side, you will see 1.1 site acquisition. And then as you go across, you will see a, black, a heavy black bar. Below that, you will see lease option and obtain uh, base of building drawings. And you see little blue items there. So th those are when the actual tasks are taking place and the black bar above it is, is the summary bar. Now you may also see that we have um, that we have here, you can maybe see that little black diamond there. That is a, what we call a, a milestone. And milestones are extremely important there as what we call a zero duration activity. And we're, we have either finished them or we haven't. So we tend to use those things uh, uh, and add them in for sign off, for major deliverables, that sort of thing. And uh, I'll just talk a little bit more about milestones here. Because milestones are extremely important. And you'll notice this uh, this curve. And when a project starts, we all go home when we work really hard, and then we get distracted, and then our level of effort kind of goes down, and then it kind of gets so maybe no one's really doing too much at all on the project. And then we realize, uh oh, we got to get this done. And then we have the panic and the high costs, and we have to sort of jam it all in at the end. What we really should be doing is something like this. We should have several milestones along the way in order to avoid that panic. So we can have, you know, a, a milestone that we can all focus on the next step, the next step, the next step. So we don't end up somewhere down here in this gully and then, all, then end up with this big panic, you know, towards the end. Earned value is a very important uh, tool that we use in project management. And you'll see along the bottom, we've got time. And on the other axis, we have cumulative cost. And uh, on this particular project, we have um, we have our, our cost baseline. That is the, the amount of money we plan to spend at various times, and that leads us to our, our budget at completion. But we don't just sort of sit back and say, well, let's just see what it costs in the end. We want to have a good idea as we go along if we're trending above uh, over budget or uh, if we're getting ahead of schedule, behind schedule, and so on. So we will do a little sanity check here. Time now. So we're going to check and see how we're doing. And we may check and we may discover that we have spent more money than we planned. The initial instinct might be to say, well, this project's in trouble, but not necessarily. This project might be okay even if we spent more than we planned, if we've actually accomplished more work than we had planned to accomplish at this point. But in this particular case, our earned value or the amount we've accomplished is actually less than what we planned. So this is not good. We can calculate our, our cost variance and our schedule variance, and we're not going to go into how all these formulas work. But suffice to say that we can use these formulas to extrapolate, based on our current performance, what is this project going to look like in the end? How much is it going to cost us to complete this project? And that's very helpful information because people can be flexible with only their warning. So this is a very good tool for that. 
but it also mm -hmm. gives us the chance to say we are uh, running behind schedule or we are going over budget and then we can do things to control that situation. Just a few words about risk here. Uh, we often talk about different uh, components in risk and risk is essentially anything that can get in the way of our success. It's an uncertain event. We talk about the risk event itself. We talk about the probability. How likely is it to happen? What might the impact be if it happens? And then also about the urgency. You know, something that might happen, you know, in the next 24 hours is obviously a much more urgent event than something that's going to happen, you know, two years down the road. We also use these impact matrices, like you have in, on the lower right-hand side, where you might have probability on one and then impact on the other. We might describe an event like that. We might say that this is a low probability, high impact event. There's, risk is a very compli complicated and, and complex uh, uh, thing to talk about, and, and I'm just giving you like the, just a brief little overview here. But essentially, what I want you to think about is that with risk, you have to talk about what might go wrong. Because if you don't talk about what might go wrong, you really have no way, you really have no way of, um, no way of, um, of, of solving the problem. You have to talk about what could go wrong. Now what I want to do here is uh, move on with um, another study. And we want to thank the Project Management Institute because they commissioned this study and I think it was great that they got this put together. And they talked to KPMG and uh, KPMG uh, surveyed 600 firms from around the world. And they were trying to determine where project management was going. And, and they found that 81% of the companies that were surveyed said that they had a significant increase in complexity in their projects. 88% said, uh, oh, sorry, no, 81 was an increase in the number of projects, and 88% was increase in complexity. And 79 said they've had an increase in their, in their project budget. So basically, projects are becoming you know, more complex, you know, uh, we need more money for them, all that sort of thing. But what is also interesting is that the significant increase in the number of projects and complexity uh, is greater than the actual increase in the budgets. That's a bit of a kicker. So the use of uh, standardized uh, PM practices, they asked a question about that too. And the question that was part of the study that, that uh, PMI commissioned uh, KPMG to do was, to what extent does your organization use standardized project management practices? And we can see that um, we have, uh, you know, what do we have? A total of 57% of people are either using them throughout the organization or, use them, or most people are using them. But there's certainly a lot of room for improvement with 37% saying only some people use them and 7% saying we're not using them at all. Well, that's an interesting fact. Okay, interesting statistic, but, but what does that mean? So this tells a bit of a story now. This is the kind of thing that we can actually uh, help us, we can help, it, help, it can help us draw some conclusions here. So we look at it and we see that the organizations that use standardized practices throughout their organization uh, on a regular basis are the most successful when it comes to delivering projects on time and within budget. If they're only using them most of the time, their success level is going down and, and increasingly it goes down if, it's, if they're only used by some or if they're not used at all. It almost looks like they rigged that, but I know that they didn't. This was a very scientific study that they did. Another question that was asked was, does your organization have a project management office, a PMO? 61% said yes, 39% said no. Okay, that's interesting too, but, but what does it mean? What, what can we actually find out from that information? So we looked at that and, uh, and basically we have organizations with PMOs doing better both in terms of finishing on time and in terms of finishing uh, under the original budget. Interesting. Does your organization purport, pur support certification for project managers? And 87% of the people said yes, 13% said no. 
What does that mean? This, of course, comes as no surprise. That the, the organizations who support certification have better success with being on time and within budget. Now, that's not to say that people get certified, it's that they support it, they support the education, they support the process. The percentage of uh, PMPs in an organization, and uh, with this one here, we have a very similar, uh, similar situation, not at all surprising, and I'll show you the next slide. And people with, uh, with uh, the larger percentage of PMPs in their organization, once again, Better, better track record in terms of being on time and within budget. And these are looking uh, so, like, well, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a complete direct function of, um, of how many people have PMPs and how well they do, you know? Interesting, interesting how well that's tied together. I want to just talk just a tiny bit about uh, the Project Management Institute's uh, career framework. And, um, Employees were asked, you know, what is the most important thing to you? And the most important thing, and this was a study, um, this was one of the studies that, uh, that was uh, done, a job retention study. And for them, career development opportunities was the most important thing. Uh, competitive salary second, flexible work hours third. Interesting. Because it does cost a lot of money to hire new employees, so we certainly want to keep the ones we have. So with PMI's career framework, uh, what they're looking at is they're saying that you need to have plans and maps that link skills and career progression. And people need to clearly see where they can go if they acquire certain skills and, and what those benefits will be. And you need to look at sort of competencies required uh, for various roles within job families. Now, isn't that an interesting statistic at the bottom? 67% of organizations do not have a project management career path. So what that essentially means is 67% of organizations have what we call accidental project managers. Well, it's a little hard to just be an accidental project manager and plan for that kind of career if there's no career path in place in an organization. It makes it very discouraging for those who want to be project managers. All right, so another thing that they did here is they, um, they set up job descriptions. So they uh, have sample job descriptions and then they can have this content which they can build uh, to custom projects and so on. And uh, these organizations then can um, modify this plan if they need to. And they can modify the job descriptions, the project, the portfolio management, the leadership skills or whatever. Whatever levels of proficiency that they want to modify, they can. They can also modify the educational requirements. But essentially, you know, what PMI is saying is here's a framework. You can take this framework and then apply it to your organization so that it works for you. And they have, oh, here's a little screen capture here that just shows you, um, shows you uh, what they have on the website. And uh, this is actually created for, um, based on the project manager one job description and project managers, actually were associate project managers were asked to identify specific tasks required for the job. Well, this one here, this, uh, this slide kind of builds as we go. And um, PMI has identified that the professional and, and project management skills that practitioners in the role of project manager, uh, program manager, and portfolio manager uh, need to have for their roles. And then they surveyed the practitioners and identified the leadership skills that practitioners uh, need as well in project management, portfolio management, and so on. And in the same survey, they identified the project typology that they needed, or the, or the, or the way that they could actually categorize different projects. And finally, um, you know, we believe that um, project managers must be able to speak uh, to subject matter, to, to speak um, uh, subject matter to subject matter experts in their language and so on, and that project team members must understand some of the project management terms. So we've got the project manager one, project management two, project manager three, and so on, all the way up, program manager and portfolio manager. Essentially what this is, it's a tool that you can use if you want to classify project managers, program managers, and so on, and what tools and skills they need at, at different and various levels. 
Here's another uh, model for project management maturity, and this is uh, the Microframe uh, Technologies uh, Project Management Maturity Model. And this one says that if you don't have any project management processes at all, and anything that might have to be done in the name of formal project management, if it's just kind of happens, if it happens, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't, well, that's ad hoc. And, and ad hoc is usually uh, a level where no one is really doing anything consistently. And if anyone does do anything, it, it's probably more heroic on the part of one or two individuals. So that's sort of ad hoc and, and project management. And that's not really very successful. The next step up would be abbreviated. And with abbreviated, there might be some very basic budget and schedule monitoring, that sort of thing. Once you get to the organized level, you're getting more, more consistent success. And organized would be when people are actually using the Project Management Institute framework, the, the PMI framework, they have their own methodologies, they may have people that are PMPs or certainly striving in that direction, but there's some consistency around what they do. At the managed level, that would be uh, when people are actually trying to determine the, their success level and, and uh, you know, if they're using certain tools, they're actually trying to find out, are these tools really helping us with our time and with our budget and the various elements of the project? So they're trying to get some statistics back on their success, like how much effort they're putting into the project management uh, tools and, and what they're actually getting back from it. And then finally, at the adaptive stage, this is when people know the rules. They're experienced people, they have processes, they have their methodologies, but now they also break the rules because they understand the process well enough and they understand project management well enough and their environment that they can successfully break the rules and know when that is the right thing to do. And what's kind of unfortunate sometimes is there are people out there who think that they are at the adaptive level when in fact they're really at the ad hoc level. Because the ad hoc people are breaking rules too, but they're doing it blindly. They don't really know why they're doing it. They're just kind of wailing away. And obviously that doesn't really lead to the great success on projects. Now here's another, um, here's another model here. And this model says that we may have, you know, organizations have unique projects or very similar projects. They could be small, they could be large. And one size doesn't fit all with project management. So what do we need if we have you know, projects that are very unique? Well, we need strong project management and business analyst skills. Certainly that would be the, say, the most difficult situation to be in. If you have many small projects and they're unique, in that particular case, then you need simple project management tools and VA tools. If you have large projects, but they're similar, well, very systematic procedures would be would be required. And if they're small projects and very similar, well then maybe you're actually just needing good continuous improvement uh, improvement tools. So not all projects are the same. One size does not fit all. And you need to decide what tools are required in your environment, what would be appropriate in your environment. So how do we get this uh, these BA and PM things happening in your organization? How do we introduce this to your organization? Well, the first thing is you have to have senior management visibly committed because if they're not, then you know you're you're done before you started. You know you got to have them on board, and the functional managers, your department heads, they have to be on board too, and you have to pick which methodologies you're going to use, which tools you're going to use. You might choose to have a project management office. You have to either hire or select.